So welcome everybody. Thanks. Thank you all so much for joining us. We'll give everybody a chance to get logged in here. Um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Tell us where you're joining us from. And, and if you want to tell us what ministry you're involved in, some, some folks are in direct ministry with young adults. Some folks are in analogous ministries that touch the lives of young adults. So definitely tell us where you're coming from. All right, from Dallas. Hello, Katie from Dallas. Deacon Chris from uh, St. Louis. Hello, uh, hello, Sarah from Baltimore. <laughs> oh, that's a funny one. <laughs> oh, Katie, and yes. Devin from Wyoming, the Newman Center at the University of Wyoming. Fantastic. Nicole <laughs> from Esteem. Nicole, that's a working chat. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> Uh, we've got Maggie from Allentown and Mike from uh, uh, is the cordon. Oh, so things are moving along so quickly here. <laughs> well, if you know who I'm, you know who I am. Who you're talking to here? Um, <laughs> Alessandro from Chicago, Sister Adelina from uh, Saint Angelo, Texas. Although Al Alessandro from Chicago also wanted to acknowledge the. The rest in peace for the Chicago Bears for all oh. that. That was a couple weeks <laughs> yeah. ago. And to rest all those and all, to all those sports franchises who have been lost in the weeks of, oh. of playoffs. We we simply want to offer hey, my hometown, you know, Alma, not hometown, close enough. The Bills have still made it. Haven't they? The Bills or they are they still made it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, the, right? Okay. Go Bills, go New York. <laughs> First time since I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's some sort of Christian theology about rooting for that underdog for the, you know, hey, Pope the Francis last talks shall about... be first and the first shall be last. Yeah. It's, the prefer well, it's the preferential option in sports. The preferential <laughs> option for the Bills. <laughs> for the Bills. Oh, my cousin would love that. <laughs> That's a new one, Marilyn. <laughs> yes, oh, I'm going to use it. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> Well, we're oh, also awesome. welcoming Becky from Williamsport, PA, Sister Sydney from Los Angeles, Jillian from Erie, Timon from Crown Point, Indiana. We got some limb friends. I see some graduates. We've got Tammy Vadreen. So good to have you on today, Tammy. We've got Diane and we have Rick Beban. Love you, Rick Beban. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, friends. And Lynn from Springfield, Missouri. Good to see you, Lynn. Ah, Deacon Andy, what's up? From Southern <laughs> California, fantastic. Well, we're we got a we got so several glad. Crown Point Indians. Well, what can you say? <laughs> it is the uh, it, it it's actually not pretty nearby where my hometown is, so um, it is a pretty great place. So uh, <laughs> right, right. Here it comes again. There's always the Indiana references. I sixty five in the middle of a cornfield in Indiana. Make your way to Crown Point, Indiana. They'll treat you fine there. <laughs> We'll, we'll treat you fine. <laughs> well, Tracy, it's good well, to have wonderful. so many people here today. Um, uh, why don't we kind of just get ourselves started? So this, uh, as much as people <clears throat> want to be in good company, um, I'm sure they didn't log on just to hear names of themselves. Uh, so we can dive into this wonderful topic. <laughs> you never know. Though. You never know. I mean, we don't want to, we, we're not judging here, but uh, you, never you, know, know. you never know. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody, and thank you all so much for being with us today. I'm I can't be more excited about our lineup today and our and our conversation piece. I've been using the the directory for catechesis uh, all last semester, and so now we can actually really unpack it in terms of ministry with with young adults. So I'm I'm looking very forward to this conversation today, and I know our our uh, panelists and as well uh, our attendees are are also. So thank you all so very much. Um, so I am Tracy Lamont. I'm assistant professor of religious education at the Loyola Institute for Ministry at Loyola University, New Orleans. Um, before coming to Loyola, I served as a parish youth and young adult minister, and I also worked as a high school teacher, and for a short stint, elementary school. Um, and I'm the vice chair of resources for the USCCB National Advisory Team on Young Adult Ministry, where I'm very, very grateful to serve in this capacity as one of your um, co-moderators and facilitators today with my dear friend, Paul Jerzembowski, who works for the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops as the assistant directory for youth and young adult ministries in the Secretariat of Lady, Marriage, Family, Life, and Youth. 
Paul also serves as the staff liaison for the USCCB National Advisory Team on Young Adult Ministry and the Institute, the National Institute for Ministry with Young Adults. So thank you, Paul, for being my co-host, uh, co-assistant here today. <laughs> it's quite, quite fine and wonderful to be with you. And again, thank you. Thank you, everybody, <laughs> for being part of this conversation. So, but let, Tracy, who do we have with us today? We've got this great lineup. So tell us a little bit about our our great team that we have assembled here today to unpack catechesis with young adults. I'm so very, very excited. We have today and so grateful for your time. Um, first, we have Marilyn Santos, who is Associate Director for Evangelization and Catechesis at the USCCB. Before joining the conference, Matt Marilyn was Director of Youth and Young Adult Outreach at the National Office of the Pontifical Mission Societies in the United States. She's held leadership positions in youth and young adult and cultural diversity ministries in the Archdiocese of Atlanta and Brooklyn. And she also taught for nine years in the Archdiocese of New York on the elementary and middle school levels. We have a lot in common, Marilyn. Well, you know, just the teaching part. <laughs> um, and she also worked as a parish youth ministry team member and director of youth ministry at various parishes in the Archdiocese of New York. Um, and I'm so thank you so much for joining us. She's also serves has served as the president of Lared and the National Catholic Network um, of Pastoral Juvenile Hispania. So thanks, Marilyn, for joining us today. Second up, we have um, Jose Amaya. He is the director of faith formation of the Archdiocese for the Military Services in the USA. He's responsible for the implementation of the AMS Forming Disciples for the New Evangelization Archdiocesan Religion Curriculum Guide and the AMS Family Witness to Christ Digital Platform for Ministries to Grow in Faith at Home. He's a catechist formation. He's involved in catechist formation and catechetical leadership development. The Archdiocese serves 1.8 million Catholics at 220 military installations in the continental United States and around the world. Jose holds a master's degree in divinity from Washington Theological Union, and he worked as a parish director of religious education and an archdiocesan coordinator of catechist formation and Hispanic catechesis for 10 years in the Archdiocese of Washington. He's a facilitator of online learning with the University of Dayton's virtual learning community for faith formation and a member of In Word and Witness, um, formerly NCCL, uh, as he served as a consultant as well for the USCCB Committee on Evangelization and Catechesis. So welcome to you, Jose. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Tracy. And then last, never least at all in our books, we have Jennifer Delvo. Did I say your last name correctly? Excellent. Yes, I'm working on <laughs> We were chatting before that if you're in New Orleans now, you should be used to these last names that end in X's. And so I should be better at this. <laughs> so Jennifer is the Senior Evangelization Coordinator for the Office of Evangelization and Missionary Discipleship within the Archdiocese of Chicago. She served as the church, she served the church through pastoral ministry for over 15 years. For over a decade, she enjoyed the adventure of accompanying teens and young adults in their faith journeys. Beyond the usual calendar of youth groups and retreats, this included several World Youth Day pilgrimages, service learning trips to Guatemala, and the challenge of pastoral care to youth and facing tragedies and health concerns. And so we are so grateful that you are with us today, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our, our Dynamo speakers who are gonna to talk today. One of the things I absolutely love about um, the new directory for catechesis is the overlapping themes with ministry with young adults. A lot of the topics that we hone in on, a lot of the topics that are emerging from Christus Vivit in the Synod on Young People um, are these themes that you also find in the directory, which are themes of encounter, accompaniment, and missionary discipleship. Wait, where'd my book go? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since we're all going to wave our books around. Um, so I'm going to open it up to you, Marilyn, if you want to go ahead and get us started and tell us what, you know, your experience is and, and give us some ideas for ministry with young adults with the new directory. Sure. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you, uh, Paul, for the invitation. Um, I, I guess I'm going to open with a full disclosure. I love this document. Um, it, it's um, because of my position here at the conference, um, it, is, it, it, it fell on me to be the, the lead to implement it. And, um, and I know we've all had, you know, sometimes we're assigned tasks in our respective jobs, even though we love our church that maybe we're not as excited about. Um, this is so not the case for me. So um, this is such a blessing 
um, that I get to um, talk about this document a lot. I, I would say that I guess the, the overarching um, why I, I love it so much is that this new directory, um, it challenges us um, as individuals um, and as church with the big C. It, it challenges us to re-look re at what our concepts, definitions, and practices of catechesis. And it also challenges on who is a catechist. But what it also does that I don't know if it was um, the Holy See's intention, but I think it comes out loud and clear. It really affirms that ministry uh, with and for young adults as a vital area for catechesis because it focuses, it places catechesis as a dimension of the evangelization process, as opposed to, unfortunately, too often we flip it um, and catechesis is seen as like the, the umbrella and evangelization is somewhere in there. What this does, I mean, if many of us who, especially those of us who've read it thoroughly, I think that um, it would not be incorrect had it been named the directory for evangelization. Um, but then we laugh because maybe it wouldn't have sold because people wouldn't have been interested. But it, it just makes it really clear that it has to, it's a dimension. It is not the be it and end all it, of evangelization because evangelization, as we know, is that's what's necessary if we are to fulfill that call, that great commission that Christ gave to us, you know, to make disciples and to, to um, respond to that proclamation of the gospel. It, it's catechesis together with liturgy and the good works, the charity of the church. That is how we make visible this new life that's offered to us through the um, power of the Holy Spirit. Um, the directory reminds us over and over again that we must, I mean, it's not gray about it, we must be a church that's perpetually on mission because that's our identity. Our identity should be one of a missionary church. The slide that's up there is, is one of my, probably in my top two favorite um, uh, piece of the document, number 113, when um, it describes who a catechist is. Because a catechist is a witness of faith and keeper of the memory of God. We just let that sink in for a minute. That's that is so profound and so beautiful. A catechist is also a teacher and a mystagogue and a companier and an educator. So Tracy, you're, you're, in your opening statement, you were so right. The, the themes of accompaniment and encounter are just permeate this. Um, the other thing that I feel um, this document does that the prior general directory, and again, not that I'm saying that it was wrong, um, but the other one did a pretty, more than a good job on, on talking about discernment. We love that word discernment. But the prior one really didn't talk a lot about listening and accompaniment. This one um, spends a lot of time. Um, this one also talks a lot about the enculturation of the gospel as being the task of all Christians, you know, um, it, because the people of God need to be equipped to understand what that means. And it has to be integrated of all our ministry with them because we know that mission is not gonna be effective in the heart unless it's pro the proclamation is enculturated. And by that, we mean that it needs to be based on the living current realities of the people that happen to be before us, whether it's in our nation, in our diocese, or most particularly in our immediate settings, in our parish. Um, number 252, um, I'll read it directly so I don't misquote, points out the pastoral care of youth by the church is therefore to be first of all, a humanizing, and missionary outreach, which means being capable of seeing the signs of God's love and call in human experience. Notice how it doesn't say what they memorized from a book. Another thing, another place where I feel this, this directory is very challenging is that although it does, you know, acknowledge that the parish, the parish, pardon me, um, continues to be a, like what they call a privileged place for formation, that we have to be aware that the parish should not be the center for all catechesis, that we, we must rethink 
with a missionary point of view, the other possibilities of, of carrying out this, the pastoral care of catechesis. That's something else that I love, that it refers to catechesis as pastoral care, not academic, but pastoral care. Um, number 244 then also just reminds us that it's the community. Um, it says the whole community, whether that's your parish or the larger community, has the task of transmitting the faith and of bearing witness to the possibility of walking through life with Christ. The togetherness of the Lord Jesus with the two disciples of Emmaus, his walking with them, dialoguing, accompanying, helping to, helping to open their eyes, is a source of inspiration for walking with young people. And, and the last thing that I'll say before I turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Jose, is that the, the other challenge that we find in this, um, in this document, so that we don't do things, you know, the same old, same old, number 254 speaks about um, that in addition to organic and structured programs, catechesis should also be valued when it's carried out in a casual manner of life environments of young people in the school, the university, in their cultural and recreational associations. And then it points out some noteworthy experiences, diocesan, national, it talks about World Youth Day as an occasion um, for addressing many young people who otherwise would be unreachable to us. And then it reminds us that it's a good idea in preparation for the day and it's unfolding for priests and catechists to develop pathways that would permit living out this experience of faith to the full. Also not to be forgotten is the fascination that pilgrimage exercises for many young people. It is useful that this should be lived out as a catechetical moment. So those are my opening thoughts. Jose? Thank you, Marilyn. You're already challenging us uh, and expanding <laughs> our way of uh, viewing catechesis with young adults. Um, oftentimes when we uh, talk about young adult ministry or catechesis with young adults, what comes to mind, at least in my personal experience, is um, single young adults, single young men and women uh, who are in their you know, 20s or 30s. Um, but we uh, rarely do we think that um, um, there is catechesis uh, of the accompaniment of young families. So um, if we can have the slide on uh, catechesis with uh, family, that would be great. Um, uh, I, this, um, these uh, paragraphs from, um, the directory, uh, paragraphs 20, uh, 226 to 231 inspired me when I heard this, um, this topic on catechesis with young adults and its implications. Because um, in uh, paragraph 77, uh, the directory uh, stresses the importance of uh, catechesis for adults, that catechesis for adults is the chief form of catechesis and every other form of catechesis flows from uh, catechesis for adults. And so when, when we think or when we um, are reflecting about catechesis with young adults, we should think also about uh, the family, the family unit uh, rooted in human values, rooted in, uh, in the sacrament of holy matrimony. Um, they're, they're, the, the directory calls for catechesis in the family, catechesis with the family, and catechesis of the family. That it is in the heart of the family that we learn our first uh, concepts and foundations of our Catholic faith, where we begin to discover our calling in life, uh, whether it's to um, uh, the sacrament of holy matrimony or uh, the priest or religious life, where we first learned how to pray. That was my experience growing up. It was at the heart of my family where things began to lay its foundation in terms of the spirituality in the family, my faith uh, rooted in the heart of the family, but also the need for the church to proclaim the good news, uh, the charisma to the family or with the family that the family, um, uh, that the parish community is a family of families. And so there is a need to help them discover uh, the person of Jesus Christ, uh, the joy that fills 
our hearts. And in that process of discovering, uh, helping the family to realize that they have a mission, that the family uh, proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ. And so when we um, accompany the family, a young family, whether it's from its very uh, um, in initiation of, you know, uh, preparing couples for the sacrament of holy matrimony or for those who are bringing their, their children to uh, the sacraments of Christian initiation, um, or, you know, uh, just helping the, the couples to be a family. Um, it reminds us also to root this uh, approach to catechesis with young adults and with a special consideration with the option for uh, the young family rooted in the, six, uh, the five tasks of catechesis, um, which are outlined in, um, in, uh, in, in chapter two. Um, those being leading to knowledge of the faith, um, initiating into the Christian, um, the, the celebration of the mystery, um, uh, forming for life in Christ, uh, teaching for teaching prayer, and also uh, initiating or educating uh, the family to uh, lead their faith, uh, to profess their faith in the life of the community. So uh, Jennifer, take it from here. Thank you. I am approaching this from a slightly different perspective. Whereas Marilyn came at this uh, deeply passionate from day one, I picked this book up kind of holding my breath, wondering what I was going to read. I work in the Office for Evangelization and Missionary Discipleship. And so there's always that tension in the, whether it's correct or not, uh, placement of evangelization and catechesis. Mm -hmm. and so I wasn't sure. And I think I got about a page and a half in and I went, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. And then, you know, dug in, uh, lots of writing and post-it notes. So when I'm looking at this though, you know, while I have about 17 years of parish campus ministry background, I'm looking at this a little bit differently now because of where I'm sitting in that um, evangelization office that tries to help parishes with what they're doing. And our office's goals are a to help parishes create missionary disciples and form a culture of evangelization. And when I'm reading this text, I go, this is completely in sync with what we're trying to do. That from the very beginning, the document speaks of the fact that we are striving to create missionary disciples as a result of the catechesis. And that these missionary disciples and populating the parish help with what Marilyn hinted at, that need that it can't just be something that we deal with in the parish, but it's actively going out into the broader community, the various different spaces, places, and cultures that other adults and in our case, specifically young adults are populating. The question is that we can often focus exclusively our attention as people who are or have been focused on young adult ministry in that one ministry, that one area of parish life, our movement, our diocesan office, that there's this need though to look beyond that and perhaps to take up a different dimension of our call as those who minister to and with young adults. In paragraph 287, it opens saying, the agent of evangelization is the people of God, pilgrimage evangelizer. I uh, kind of mentioned um, World Youth Day and the role of pilgrimage in catechesis. And I love that analogy that weaves in a couple times throughout this. Um, but what's interesting is the use of the people of God. As we know from Vatican II, that means us as individuals and us as church. And so this is something that we're both required to do basically as individuals and as a community. And so that same paragraph concludes with just as the evangelization, so too catechesis is an action for which the whole church feels responsible. And what caught me about this is that idea of feels responsible. If you went up to any five random people in your parish and asked them, do you feel responsible for the evangelization and catechesis of young adults? Might be a very interesting response that you would get. Best case scenario, I suspect they'd say yes, and they might say that's why we give, or maybe I help bake treats for the retreat or something along those lines back when we could still do in-person activities. But what this is speaking to is a need to go deeper with that feels responsible and being proactive in the entire community participating in evangelization and catechesis. 
and that requires the formation of missionary disciples. And this is particularly important for young adults because they can have that fantastic experience in your young adult ministry. They can, you know, become deeply involved in that young adult you know, family ministry, that young adult uh, cultural movement, whatever the case might be. But what happens when they go to mass on Sunday? What happens when they have a fantastic retreat experience and want to continue joining in communal prayer and they walk into the rosary group? What happens when they, a young man inquires about the Knights of Columbus or when somebody shows up for the um, school service day not realizing that it's a school service project and is the only single person there? The question is, how are our young adults evangelized and catechized by the broader parish community. And so I think what I see within the directory is this challenge to recognize that we as young adult ministers are called as much to catechize the community and help form the community so that they're capable and acknowledge the, the responsibility and the joy that comes from being that uh, point of encounter and helping to accompany, you know, chapter two references the RCIA process, the catechumenate, and I see the value of this because a uh, prime example is back when I was working at Holy Name Cathedral as director of faith formation, I had a women's ministry, and it was half young adults, as young as 20, and half empty nesters, ranging from about 50 up to we had a retiree who was in her 80s. And it was fascinating because every retreat I would say, okay, here's the evaluation. The last question would be, do you think we should divide so that even just some events are for the young women and some are for the older women? So a person, every single time, every single retreat, they're like, absolutely not. Please tell me you're not actually contemplating this. Because I saw that deep value of accompanying one another in their journeys. Both demographics are able to help form and deepen the relationship. Uh, there was evangelization and catechesis going across both ways as they shared their life stories, they shared their faith, and they also shared some of those pastoral needs. You know, the young single mother with two small children under the age of six who was at her wit's end was able to find some, you know, unofficial aunts that would come and help her with things even as simple as grocery shopping or sit next to her at mass so that she had a spare set of hands when her very active three-year-old started crawling all over. So I think the temptation is we can see how do we apply this to our young adult ministry. My challenge is how can we see this as a point of advocating and a point of forming the broader parish organization or movement. Thank you to the three of you for uh, helping us to unpack this. Um, you know, when I first uh, encountered the directory, um, you know, I part of it, part of the struggle, I think is figuring out where to start. I mean, this is not a, uh, a light, light reading, if one could say. It's, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty thick. Um, so of course it was a struggle. Um, I, I'll admit where I, gra I gravitated to the middle of it there, or maybe about just past the middle. Um, and for those who work with young adults, it might be some place to begin. I mean, Marilyn, you, you being the, the, uh, the, the liaison at the USCCB for the directory here may have other thoughts, but my, my thought initially jumping into this was that to begin maybe where you feel most comfortable, but that one of it might be just to, to kind of get a grasp on how it, it approaches young adults directly, just speaks directly about that. And then look at all of, all of the rest of it through that lens and understanding that that's where you're, that's where you're coming from. So for me, one of the areas, um, so uh, paragraphs two, uh, 250 to 265 uh, speak about uh, catechesis with young people and catechesis with adults. And I think that those who work with young adults could kind of use both sections because again, young people as defined by Vatican documents um, is very inclusive of what we would call young adults in the United States. But since we also are very aware of their adultness, uh, having that notion of catechesis with adults, which Jose, thank you for kind of bringing that up. But then also because we know that catechesis, because young adults are very diverse, we also know that there are um, those who, young adults with disabilities, young adult migrants and refugees, young adults in marginalized communities, young adults in prison, which there are specific sections in the document uh, that speak about that, specifically 269 to 282. So when you get that, 
uh, you'll see it in the chat there are some areas where uh, you can maybe start there and then maybe look at it. Now, Marilyn, there was something you mentioned that I wanted to wonder if you could kind of help us unpack because for those of us who may not be familiar with the RCIA project process, this word, of course, is very interesting, but I think I think it starts us on our, on our direction towards the how, and that said that the directory calls all catechists, anyone called to work with any age, which includes young adults, as those who are- uh, who Mr. Goge. Mr. Goge. So could you unpack that? Sure. Ironically, I'm using the word unpack to talk about Mr. Goge, yeah, <laughs> which, is a, which I think gives a little bit of the answer away, but can you unpack that word? Because I think that that might help us understand what our role is as especially with young adults who have had these experiences thus far, baptism, maybe communion, maybe confirmation in their lives already. And as a 20 something or a 30 something, how can we be missed to go? And what does that mean? And how can we be it? So maybe that's where I want to start. Sure, sure, my pleasure. Um, I would say that um, second to mystical, the other word that we should all become familiar with is charismatic because they really go hand in hand and they are inspired um, by the, the RCIA process, for those of you familiar, and what the directory is calling us to do is to realize or remember for some of us for the, that these are two key elements because faith is a lifelong journey. Um, so the word mystagogue, it comes from the Greek, and, I, and I, if I'm getting it correct, I, I was, I'm not a Greek scholar, I think it uh, means to lead through the mysteries. Um, um, thank you. Thank you, Jose and Jay Tracy. I got it right. Um, so th 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 thanks to my Jesuit education. Um, so and so what, 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 the, what the director is saying is that that mystery of the faith is not a one-time thing. Because even with, and those of you who work in the RCIA process, I used to do it in my parish, um, we're also messing that up to use very colloquial language. <laughs> you know, um, you know, we, we lead people through the Easter vigil. It's a beautiful, glorious, I mean, it is a beautiful moment. And then we say, and for the next two weeks, we're gonna do the mystagogy, mystagogy phrase. And unfortunately, what that a lot of times turns into is um, inviting people to learn about the different mysteries of the church because we have fresh meat and and we want them to you know take on the roles but what it what it really the the mystical should be ongoing um 12 mm -hmm. months out of the year you know 24 7 whatever you want to call it is you know even as individuals it is a continued unpacking to use the word that you used of of um the mysteries of our faith, which, and, and it's tied into that other word that if I made for a minute, charismatic, because the, the literal translation is, you know, the first announcement, you know, that, that first time that you encounter this, this loving God in the person of, of, of Jesus. But what the doc, what the directory um, on and on and on and on, because it needs to be repeated, reminds us is that first announcement doesn't mean you do it one time. It means really, so in Spanish, you know, if I may, um, it works a lot better because primero means primary. So really when, when we're using the word first in English, it doesn't mean it's the first thing you do and then you do everything else. It means that it should, oh, it should whatever we do, it's the primary goal should be to um, accompany young people or whoever we're ministering with to have this continual encounter with this loving God who came in the person of, of Jesus as, as, as a person for us. So, you know, so we're called to be charismatic, always in the heart, but also to be continually unfolding the mysteries of our faith. And I love the way you said that, Marilyn. Two things that, that really struck my mind. Um, so many things struck my mind when you were all speaking, but just now, you know, when you said that the mystagogy is just not this like two week thing afterwards. And so therefore it's not just for those who just went through RCIA and came into the church, you know, like it is for all of us. And I always, I share this story. One of my students told me about, we were, we were talking about um, various different topics in religious education. And, you know, he read an article by Kathleen O'Gorman about who has a very like, like foundational ecological sense to her spirituality. And, um, she wrote about grace and finding grace, kind of very Jesuit in finding, you know, God and grace in all things. And, and he said, and he's been teaching as a catechist his whole life. And he said, I finally, I've taught what grace is. 
I thought I knew what grace was. I thought I knew the definition of God's grace. He said, and then he read the article and really kind of unpacked for him what it meant. And he said he sat and saw one of the most magnificent sunsets he's ever seen in his entire life. And he felt grace for one of the first times, you know, so like, that's mystikachi for me, you know, like, so no matter how old we are, how, how long we've been in ministry, how many things we think we've learned, we will never fully experience the fullness that is God's mysteries and God's grace in our lives. And so to make that a part of accompaniment with young adults, we have to model it first, you know, and so us finding God in all things, and, and it goes back to, um, and so the second thing I was going to connect that to was Jennifer, when you were, and, and Jose, when you were talking about, you know, family life, and then Jennifer, you were talking about, you know, those moments of encounter in the parish, you know, how the parish and families, uh, you know, when, when families come in, moments of catechesis with them, and how the, the parish community actually practices accompaniment in catechesis. And to me, that really meant in kind of a concrete way is, you know, Jennifer, you said something about like somebody, you know, inquiring with Knights of Columbus or, you know, showing up maybe for the wrong event, you know, how are they, how is catechesis and accompaniment flowing from those encounters? And so rather than, you know, in ministry, especially in your parish and all of the ministries in your parish, rather than coming around and saying, hey, the new directory says, this is how we should accompany young adults, you know, accompany your young adult, your, your, your minister first and say, hey, have you ever had an experience where someone's come in? How have you handled that? Have you considered it a moment of accompaniment? You know, like, and, but that's about forming relationships with the people that are in, we're in ministry with that we probably don't see very much. Like Knights of Columbus, they do, you know, this thing over there. I do this thing here. RCA does that thing. You know, we're all in these silos. And what I'm hearing from this is if ministry with young adults is going to be parish wide, then it means that all of the ministries have to start, ministry leaders have to start forming more robust relationships with one another and accompany one another. So that's what one of the huge takeaways I was hearing from all three of you speaking, because that's where your families will encounter catechesis as well. So, so in any event, um, I don't know that we have any questions here yet, Paul, but did you have another one you were going to throw out? I probably have a million, but I don't need to keep talking. <laughs> or if you all want to, you know, have any response to anything we just said. When I was hearing uh, uh, Marilyn uh, and also Jennifer talking about, um, you know, those key moments if we if we remember jesus took advantage of moments you know he had moments with those people that he encountered and um you know talking about uh, the mist about the mystical the church gives us the the tools and the the resources that we need to um to be that mystical and to lead people into those mysteries um, you know, to finding God in everything, but above all, in the liturgy, the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Holy Eucharist. Um, it's, 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 as you said, uh, Tracy, it's about building relationships, right? It's building relationships at the heart of the family among, um, you know, peer and fellow uh, ad young adults um, and accompanying. Accompanying, it reminds me of... Um, of a moment that I had with, uh, with a young adult in, you know, active duty young adult in the military when I was doing a catechist training. And um, I had shared about a moment and this young adult uh, in the break said, um, Jose, would you come and have dinner with a group of young adults? All we want is to have dinner and, you know, drink something. And I said, oh, great. Um, yes, sure, why not? And that was all. It was about having a moment, a grace-filled moment with these young adults where they happen to be in their life um, and, 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 and building those relationships, having a meal. And wasn't that what Jesus did to stay in, you know, in, in the Holy Eucharist, in the, meal, in the meal? So the church gives us those um, tools and um, it, it's... Uh, a, a, I like the, the, what you said, Tracy, about being challenged to rethink what kind of accompaniment, what kind of catechesis, what kind of charisma, mm -hmm. uh, and how are we doing it um, as a parish community and why not as a diocese? Um, and it might, not, it might not happen overnight, it will not actually, but how can we become holy influencers mm -hmm. so that we can see some change uh, beginning to, to happen? 
Thank you, Jose. We have a few questions rolling in here. And um, I'm going to start with um, Katie has a good one. And, and we have several that got upvoted. So they're all equally as good now. Um, and so those that don't know, you can click a little thumbs up sign if it's one that you also really want to hear. Um, so Katie wrote, she's, she says she loves the definition of catechesis as pastoral care, which is a very new lens for her to think of and probably for many of us. Um, you know, and, and, oh, it moved, sorry. Um, so do you know where it is in the text where it talks about that? And, and I can look while you all are talking and, sure. or if somebody knows right away. Um, it's in many places. Um, I know it's specifically in chapter seven. Um, okay. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact, um, it might be 254, but I don't quite have it memorized yet, but I, but I, I I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's in chapter seven, but I also know that it shows up more than once. So Katie, yeah. um, um, I would agree with you. It is kind of a new um, concept for many of us, mm -hmm. but um, it's important. And, and if you read through the document, um, it's not just the one-off, which again, I think gives it a more weight on how important this is. Yeah. So in following up on that, can anybody think of an example, she asked, um, of catechesis in a pastoral care situation? One that I know came up because I was in charge of an RCIA process mm -hmm. that had about 40 some folks in it every year and about two thirds to three quarters were young adults. So that was obviously direct catechesis there, but then the inevitably we would have about five to seven annulments out of those young adults that we would have to accompany them through. And frequently there's a lot of trauma involved in that. And even when it's a, a very can't think of a better word than say neutral or at least um, benevolent break, that there's questions of, well, God does, you know, I made this promise before God, or, you know, does God hate me because of, or was God punishing me because of? And so oftentimes in that accompaniment and in that process were profound moments of being able to talk about the nature of God, the nature of divine love, things that you know, theologically, you can go into great detail about, but that would be so removed. But here in that deeply, deeply personal context were an option to make that not only something intellectual that, yes, we would touch on at some point in the RCI process, but that was directly related to where they were at with that pastoral need. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if, if I may, I, I would, that's a beautiful example, but I also think what the director is asking us to do is to look at it from the other lens and that look at the actual ministry of catechesis as pastor, primarily pastoral. Mm -hmm. And yeah. by that, I mean that um, in all the planning and or whatever it is that we do, the lens that we should be measuring it is, how is this going to affect the heart before the head? Right. Of, of those that I've been given the privilege um, to accompany. One of the things I keep quoting from uh, our uh, National Forum in Ministry with Young Adult back in December, I think I've got the title wrong, sorry, but <laughs> our, our National Forum was, uh, there was a keynote presentation, I think it was Doug Took that said it, because I quote him all the time now, and he said, you know, we do three things really well, you know, three things as a church we do, you know, preaching, teaching, and healing. He said, the preaching, you know, we're getting there. Um, teaching, we do a lot of, like you're saying, Marilyn, you know, this kind of head knowledge, unfortunately, because um, it should be holistic, but too often it's comprehension based. Um, and then healing, where is the healing? And that's what I'm seeing with this concept of catechesis is it needs to be a part of pastoral care and healing. Healing, that's a huge aspect of, of the Catholic Church and of what Jesus came to say and do. And that's where I'm seeing catechesis being redirected in that language of pastoral care and healing. So thank you both for those. And I'm sorry, I'm just, I don't want to, but I guess something else, I'm sorry how you all the time is what's, <laughs> and in order to be pastoral, we need to know who it is that isn't in front of us. Yep. And, and, and in brief, I remember I was teaching fourth grade. And if those of you remember the, the, the curric, the core curriculum, religion curriculum is the commandments. And mm -hmm. I remember as we were going through the commandments, um, Holy Spirit moment. Um, I, I was teaching in a lower income, Lower East Side school when I realized that most of the young people in front of me were not exactly living, um, you know, a, within sacramental marriages. So I really, re, you know, without 
changing certainly the church teaching on the, and those particular commandments, my approach to them, I had to really redo my lesson plan, so to speak, um, conscious that these, these fourth graders in front of me were going to go home thinking that, you know, their parents are going to hell. Um, yep. So, yep. Well, and even when dealing with marriage preparation, you know, I think that that's one of the areas of encounter that many parishes have with young adults is uh, working with with couples who are getting married. Um, and, uh, you know, if they're, you know, how, how do we do we just teach the couples um, that are before us to teach them about marriage or about their, you know, or do we get to know those those couples? And I like what you even said there, Marilyn, that one of the one of the areas that the directory calls us to is to be listening. And when you think about catechesis, our often our minds as catechesis with any person is us speaking it and it flows from here to you out the mouth. Whereas what you're saying is that listening is a component to catechesis, which actually is a which can be a, a, a you know strange to some people because listening, wait, catechesis is me talking to you and 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 filling you with the knowledge of the faith rather than oh listening to their realities and understanding their situations, understanding who they are, listening to their stories, as much as sharing your own story, sharing the story of faith. So listening, I, I like the fact that that listening is emphasized as much as it is. Um, another question that's come in, and maybe, Jose, maybe you could kind of, uh, uh, the interesting, you talk about family formation, all the ministry flowing from the transitory natures of young adults who don't have parents. Okay, so so all the ministry that flows from the transitory nature of young adults who don't have parents nearby or young adults who are single. So can you speak of family formation with young adults who are, you know, not, you know, connected to their families, perhaps any, you know, anymore, either because they're living in a different area or young adults just are single, you know, and, and or, or young adults in, in other situations. But how does, how does catechesis in, with, and from the family uh, work when it comes to these situations with young adults. I don't, if you wanted to kind of share a little bit of that as well. Oh, that's a very uh, uh, compacted question. It's a really good one. Um, I, I, my, my ministry is primarily with um, with catechesis. It's primarily with uh, religious education, if you will. But in in the ministry that um, that I'm doing, I encounter not only young couples um, who are the parents of the children that are in the religious education programs, um, but also young adults who um, don't have family nearby. Um, one of the things that, um, and they don't necessarily have to be uh, Catholic themselves, but one of the things that I have experienced, um, maybe this can illustrate uh, that a little bit, is um, when a family is open to welcome um, a young adult who may be single and far away from um, their own family. I've had uh, uh, quite a few uh, young adults who have expressed to me what a joy it is to belong to a family, even though it's not their own family and it's a family away from their personal family. The family is being open to uh, welcome them in special occasions like Christmas or for their birthday or Thanksgiving, and they cannot afford to go home, um, being able to be part of that family experience. Um, and, and families who are also open to uh, accompany these young adults um, who may not have a family nearby. Um, so my, even though my, my primary role is to form and to um, accompany young families, I do also find working, you know, with young adults who don't have a family, but equipping those families uh, or helping them uh, to see that there are young adults in their midst that don't, don't necessarily have a family. And when they have uh, live-in witnesses, families who are open to journey with them, they begin to also uh, have an encounter with the Lord because the family is a, a witness. Of, uh, of, our, of the faith that we live. Um, so um, I don't know, Marilyn and, uh, and Jennifer, if you have a, a, any other thoughts about that. It, this was the young adult ministry at Holy Name. It was uh, pretty much all young adults who'd relocated to the area 
uh, who didn't have family in the immediate area. And the other half of the population was empty nesters who actually their children had moved out, gone away to college, started their own careers elsewhere. And so what we really intentionally did with the aspects of the adult faith formation was to in not only have the young adult ministry and a specific age-based ministries, but think about how we could approach topics, how we could approach the structures of what we were doing to appeal to both age groups and to also invite both age groups into leadership, into different accompaniment roles, and to not presume that it was always the older adults mentoring the younger adults. I think that that's sometimes a, a false assumption or um, at least not entirely accurate. And so what we often would see were those relationships that would naturally grow of different couples um, meeting up to you know, support that single young adult who wasn't able to travel home. But I think there can also be very intentional particular moments. Um, when the pandemic struck, a parish that I am working with matched up every young adult member with one of their senior group members. And initially it was with that concept, oh, our young adults can help the seniors who really need to stay locked down. They were part of a, a minority community who were very much um, hearing from home about the devastation, not able to return back to their families abroad. And so what was uh, absolutely brilliant about this that they weren't anticipating then is the longevity of the pandemic that this relationship grew. And so, you know, those phone calls would turn into prayer calls. Those FaceTimes that they helped to set up would turn into scripture reflection and faith sharing. And so the re that which started as kind of a natural, just let's check up on our older parishioners grew into a mutually beneficial formation and prayer experience. And so I think it's thinking about it from both sides and creating the spaces for it and making sure that everyone has that equal space as leaders and uh, is valued and acknowledged within that process. Yeah, that, that, that's excellent. And as I was hearing the two of you share, what came to mind is, um, you know, I, and I think we've already spoke about it, that the directory really emphasizes that the parish needs to transform themselves as a missionary society formed of disciples, which then means that everybody's responsible for catechesis. And, and, and it does go to the trouble, I don't remember exactly which chapter, where there is a section when the, then, it, then it pulls apart, that of course there are a particular group that are called to a specific kind of catechesis, you know, the one that we, the traditional one I'm gonna call it, but it's, the fact that the director goes to the trouble of actually including a section where it calls out and, and then does speak about um, the different levels of formation that's necessary. You know, I, I want to make it clear that the, direct, the director does not at all negate or think that there is no need for head knowledge. It, it does. It just says that it's not the primary. But, but, but what that means to me is, and you guys just gave wonderful examples, and, and the question is that if, if the parish is structured or, or that's their vision, that everybody is a disciple, and thus that means that we care for each other, um, and, and those are, and those are valid catechetical and evangelization moments, not just what happens um, in the four walls of, of the classroom and those forty five minutes or whatever it is that. that and that, that's important. That that's important to um, also know the different contexts uh, in which um, people find themselves, especially young adults um, in the twenties, thirties. Um, and providing one of the things that, um, that the directory also highlights is popular re religiosity. Mm -hmm. And among those, um, uh, you know, those ideas is uh, pilgrimages uh, mm -hmm. or devotions. And um, having a pilgrimage can be a beautiful moment of catechesis mm -hmm. in this spectrum of evangelization and evangelizing moment that touches and that pierces the heart of the individual, as you very well said, Marilyn, um, beginning with the heart. Um, those, those are moments uh, of, um, of being together and encountering the Lord um, mm -hmm. in, in their midst. Um, also, maybe, um, uh, you know, F um, Bishop Barron speaks about um, providing moments of service. <laughs> where people can engage in service and why not have families and single young men and women come together for a purpose and 
as they do that moment of service, that moment of um, grace, um, to reflect and to do it in, you know, in the context of prayer and reflection, finding the meaning. What is the meaning of this? Uh, that may be a window, not only for those of us who are sitting in the pews, the young adults who are sitting in the pew, but also those that may not even profess a faith uh, in anything. Uh, they, they may be agnostic or, or atheists, um, uh, to say the least, but having that moment where they can experience something that is meaningful in their lives. Yeah, I mean, this chap chapter 11 is dedicated to the whole culture piece. Um, and, and the other night, um, I'm not going to take credit, um, I had the, the privilege of listening to Bishop Danny, Daniel Flores from Brownsville speak on chapter 11. Um, and he was incredibly honest with us. And he said, let's face it, um, the, the, the real moments of faith, you know, those initial, they don't happen in the parish. It happens mm -hmm. at home and it happens within their specific mm -hmm. culture. So I think one of the subsections in chapter 11 is the, it says the catech, of catech, uh, catechisms of particular churches. And, and um, again, in Spanish, particular really means individual. So I think it, that's a better translation. Um, so what, what, but what it's pointing to is that it's those, as the popular religiosity that Jose just mentioned, you know, those are real catechetical moments that are going to touch the heart and are the spark. And that um, that's going to happen at home, the probability more mm -hmm. than um, in the, the building that is, that is the parish. And, and what are we doing if enough or if anything to really encourage that and then build, build upon it? Or do we just... Um, laugh it off is just a silly little superstition, um, you know, because, you know, the end, because it, it is a moment for catechesis, because, you know, um, there are moments and, you know, I'm just thinking back from my own family experiences where there's a little confusion and, and you know, we have to be careful that enculturation doesn't become syncretism because then that's bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but if you think about it, that's a catechetical moment um, mm -hmm. to, to, to walk with somebody um, and, and unpack what the differences are. And that's and, and then you know we're talking about here the about the parish and the uh, the home, but also let's stretch it a little bit. You know, if we look at the at the complexity of context, catechetical moments or evangelizing moments can happen when you're flying a 14-hour flight to Japan, which has <laughs> happened to me, or you're buying um, you know uh, uh, um, mustard seeds at the store, and a young adult says. Oh, if ye had faith, and then another <laughs> response. Oh, yeah, um, you know. Um, or you may be pumping gas at the gas station, and a lady approaches you and says, "Jesus loves you." Isn't that one of the uh, charismatic uh, statements that we, you know, the proclamation uh, uh, statements that we make? And another lady may answer, "Oh, yeah, hallelujah." Those are catechetical moments, and they don't necessarily happen you know, in a classroom or at home. It happened on the go. Right. Jennifer, I saw you unmute yourself at one point. Oh, I, no, I actually just muted because a, a fire engine came right down next to my window and I didn't want everybody to lose their hearing. So oh, I, that was it. Yeah. Thank we you all so really much. That was that was wonderful. We were going to move to Darius's question on culture, and, I, and we're short on time now, but I feel you all just answered it um, um, very well. And I wonder, Paul, if we just go maybe five or ten minutes over time, if we want to take Sister Adeline's question real quick. Um, sure. How does that sound? And then, and then yeah, maybe we'll close. Great. Well, and one of the things we, that, we have um, one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, one of the questions we're getting is, you know, we talked before, especially with the, with the conversation of Miss Nagosia about the mystery. Well, we're not so comfortable with mystery. Um, mystery is one of those things that, you know, we, 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 you know, the mystery of the life of a young adult, the mystery of faith that we profess, the mystery of how culture intersects the faith. I mean, there's so many mysteries that we kind of wrestle with. And, um, but we're so used in our parishes to uh, a very black and white uh, you have a question, I have an answer. Your question is five parts, my answer is five parts. Um, and we have very exacting kind of in this, in our, in our American culture, we have that kind of reality in many of our parishes. And that's when people think about catechesis with young adults, there is this kind of thought process that goes on in terms of, you know, 
we have to provide these prepackaged answers for these anticipated questions that they're dying to ask. But what you're saying is that there's a lot more mystery. There's a lot more nuance. There's a lot more unpredictability to catechesis. How can we help our parishes get comfortable with that? Because that's I, I, right now, that is one of the biggest challenges is our parishes are often used to a mindset that isn't as diverse of an understanding of catechesis and evangelization as the directory offers. And that's going to be a big challenge because what Marilyn presented, yeah. people are not used to that language. But how do we help our parishes? How do we help not our parishioners get more used to this understanding of the mystery? And, and what I hear... And, yeah. and what I hear all the time from young adults is, I don't want a prepackaged answer to my deep burning question. Yes. So how do, we, how do we move into that? Well, I think if I can jump, this, this is where I, I spend my days and this is where I spend a lot of my free time thinking. That I think a huge part of it is that so many of the older adults in our parish I know even myself included, were formed in a, here's a workbook, fill in the answers and, and learn about, check the boxes, be able to know all about God, but do you know God? And so I think it's helping others if, as it says throughout the document, that this is about missionary disciples, you can't have a missionary disciple who hasn't had an encounter with the living Jesus Christ and who has had time to interact and reflect on that to share that and to be accompanied so that they then learn how to accompany. So this is investing in, you know, going back to my opening statement, the parish writ large, so that everyone hopefully has that own encounter, re-encounter, remembering their encounter, because it is something where this mystery is, we, we've heard a lot from the Ignatian spirituality yesterday and uh, definitely continuing in this discussion today, but that mystery is present in everyone's lives. They just might not know it or they might not be able to name it. And so I think helping to have others in other spaces have that encounter, be able to talk about it, to learn what it is to accompany and to be able to, as Marilyn pointed out, that listening component and that it's authentic faith sharing and it's authentically listening instead of dictating that checkbox answer, that workbook page and in that mutuality and that back and forth because truths will be shared by that person who's just encountered and truths will be shared by that person who's been you know living as a missionary disciple for decades mm -hmm. yeah. and if i could add um i think sister adelina spot on um not only is it something that's very u.s but i would even go as far as saying it's actually um our western roman catholic um, I think our, our Eastern Orthodox uh, brothers and sisters will do a much better job. They've, they've maintained, because the early church, if you think, of, if you read the Bible, it's, it's there. Um, I think our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, so maybe look to them a little bit. Um, and the other piece that I would add um, is that this is where we can take advantage um, of something that's very, very, very unique to the United States is the blessing of the diversity of people that we have here who, call, who, who claim the Roman Catholic faith. Um, because uh, Latin America, African countries, um, their way of manifesting or, or living out their faith, there's a, a much deeper comfort level with the mystery piece of it. This, I'm gonna even use the word supernatural um, a piece of it. So this would be a really good opportunity to tap into um, those experiences and maybe have them shared um, with, with the larger parishes at home. Yeah, it, the, um, the document, uh, the directory actually uh, places a, a, a huge emphasis on listening so much to say that only the one who listens can proclaim. Mm -hmm. That to me is profound. Um, I, I was thinking also of uh, Carl Runner who uh, uh, said that the human person has an openness, an immense openness to uh, the mystery, uh, the mystery. And if we, um, if we spend time listening and um, in prayer, uh, having that personal encounter with the Lord of Lords, only the one who listens, but only 
the one who encounters, who has a personal encounter, can go like the woman at the well into town to proclaim that Jesus is Lord, that I, that I have encountered the Lord. Right, right. Um, it challenges um, each and every one of us at, diff at the different levels, uh, not only the parish, not only the, the community of communities, but also the diocesan and the national, why not the whole church, uh, to rethink how we do catechesis, how do we do, how are we doing evangelization? Um, are we spending time ourselves with the word? Are we spending time ourselves with the mysteries the mysteries that we are, in, you know, introducing in Spanish, the word to introduce, it's a lot deeper uh, than, than in English. But um, are we spending time ourselves so that we listen and we go out um, to share? And, and thank you, Marilyn, for pointing out the, the Eastern uh, churches of our Catholic uh, faith that uh, maybe learning from them, just as they have uh, so much to learn from us, you know, it's a mutual um, learning process, that we can learn from them from their sp deepest spirituality. When, you know, when we think of an icon, talking about the mystery, when we, when we think about an icon, an icon is not painted. An icon is written in deep prayer. And that for me has a, a totally different meaning uh, then when I look at a, at a painting, you know, somebody painted, of course, the, the, the one who created the painting maybe had a, 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 um, a godly moment, but um, there is intentionality in writing that icon that for us as Westerners, um, it has a different meaning. So it's a, probably a, a worth spending some time in ongoing formation and ongoing uh, discernment of how we're evangelizing and catechizing our young adults and the young adult families in our midst. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I, I am mindful of our time and I am just so absolutely grateful um, that the three of you were able to share with us your wisdom and your, your wealth of experience in, in ministry. And really, I mean, this, you know, the directory, the new directory is really unpacking Christus Vivit. It's really, you know, it's following Pope Francis and many other people who are advocating for greater dialogue and listening and accompaniment. And Jose, like you were saying, we also, and you were all saying, if we are accompaniers, we have to be prepared to also be accompanied and be transformed by the stories and the lives that we encounter in our young adults. And that moves us and we encounter God in their stories. And so to constantly look at our efforts in catechesis in ministry with young adults as an opportunity for ourselves to encounter more about the vastness that God is. If that doesn't propel us out the doors of our churches, I don't know what will. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so grateful, Marilyn, Jose, and Jennifer for your time today. And, and I'm sure it, you all have email addresses that are probably public. We had a couple more questions that came in um, and perhaps maybe those that, that wrote, uh, you can do a quick Google search and find the email addresses and ask some of our speakers if you wanna follow up with them, if they wouldn't mind. Um, and, you know, and Paul, I'll give you some final words there, but I'll just wrap us up with these slides. We, you can find our recordings, you'll get an email um, probably tomorrow from Zoom from us, and, and it gives you the link to our recordings, which is right here. Give it a couple of days, we do a little bit of editing, and then we have to get them posted. So um, usually, if not by Friday, then by Monday, we usually have them posted on our website. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us today, and for many of you for joining us almost every month, you know, for our webinars. Um, our next one, Paul, I believe is February 25th. I think so, yeah. <laughs> That last Thursday, I'm going by memory. Yes, yeah, same bat time, bat channel, um, February 25th. It's a Thursday after Mardi Gras, as you can all see my baby beads that I have on for my king cake. Um, <laughs> so thank you for joining us. And if you want to learn more about studying ministry, theology, how better to accompany our young adults, then send me an email and, and consider studying with us at the Loyola Institute for Ministry. Paul, any final thoughts? Anybody have any last words I, for us today? I, I just want to say, for those who are graciously staying on to the very end, and for those who will watch this recording later, you know, the, the, the Directory for Catechesis, you know, papal documents, Vatican documents, we might sit, sit there and wonder, <laughs> what is its role? What, what, why do we possibly need to get our hands on one of these? And 
as I have discovered with Christus Vivit, and I've discovered with Evangelii Gaudium uh, and all the documents of the church, even though this is not a Pope Francis written document, it has Pope Francis's fingerprints oh. all over them. Oh, it is. Oh, it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's oh, oh, it good. is. It is so it's, obvious that his hands yeah. are all over this. <laughs> it's all over it. All, and I all think, his documents are there. <laughs> it's true. They are. <laughs> and I think why I think it's important for us, though, is number one, it gives us a foundation. I mean, I think that's one that's a key thing. We need a, you know, um, it gives us an advocacy. It gives us a language that we can articulate and we can share so that we're trying to really uh, understand. But also it helps us as leaders to better get a grasp on what it is we're doing and kind of challenging us to think beyond where we were before. I mean, the fact that this directory kind of speaks about catechesis in ways that we really aren't used to speaking about catechesis will help mm -hmm. challenge us, move us, grow us deeper towards it and give us some tools to be able to move forward. It's actually quite, the directory actually has some very practical things as well mm -hmm. as um, theological and philosophical ways. So definitely keep an eye out for that. So in it, because it is so thick, it's got all of that stuff, um, but it's definitely a starting foundation for that. So I love that you keep on mentioning how thick it is. <laughs> I know. Well, <laughs> I just looking at Christus Vivid is about that thick. And, well, uh, this, this, and, and you, know. you know, I guess the last so thing heavy. I'll say, because I don't want to scare people away by Paul reminding everybody how thick it is. It's actually beautifully written. Yes. Um, and, and it's written, um, not that it's watered down at all, but it, it is, it, it, it's, it's an easy read, I, I would say. You know, you, you don't need you. to have a million letters after your name or to be, you know, a, 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 a credentialed theologian to understand it. It's definitely written for the people. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. So, yes, no matter the length, it is definitely easy. So, <laughs> good to read. Well, thank you again. Thank you all for being a part of it. Uh, again, the USCCB is thrilled to be able to have these un unpacking of how we do how we do ministry with young adults better, how we continue to grow in our work. So thank you for helping us with this dimension of our work. Uh, and all of you, thank you for your work that you do on behalf of the church and on behalf of our young adults, on behalf of our Lord. God bless you wherever you're going next. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you to our team. Uh, we'll see you. And thank we'll you, you, Vicki, for, you know, and, and the all the, oh, let me thank the National Vicky. Advisory Team for Young Adult Ministry. We couldn't do this without y'all. <laughs> Yes, we're so grateful to, the, to Vicki and the whole team, the National Advisory Team, for being a supportive uh, element of this whole project. So thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Blessings in your ministries. Thank you. You too. Thank you.